Cog Valley Bible Church. Oh, it is a good thing to be here, everybody. So good to see you. Hello to everyone watching us on YouTube, all 3,000 of them. <laughs> Our followers are growing by the day. <laughs> Uh, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna give you some announcements first, and then uh, Michael is going to have a song for us. Then I'm gonna read a psalm, and then Denise is gonna have a song for us, and then we have Troy who will be giving us the sermon today. So, um, so a couple of announcements. One, just a reminder, since this is only the second time that we've done this, that um, at the table where you have your temperature taken, the offering um, box is there. That little house. There is hand sanitizer there. There are bug wipes. Um, and also bug spray, so if, if you need anything, please feel free to go ahead. Oh, and, and hand wipes as well. Um, and then the bathroom inside is all set up with um, the soap and paper towels and signs and all that. A um, Couple of other things, so we do have our vote next week. So just a reminder that that is um, on Google Forms, so I will send that via email. I'll send that Saturday night, and then just throughout the day on Sunday, you can do it on your phones or you can do it on your computer, and I'll send more information about that. Uh, and then we, uh, we went to the town hall and we kind of measured out the six foot distances and all that. And so um, the plan right now is actually to stay outside. So we're gonna stay outside for a little bit longer, weather permitting, um, praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, and so if it looks like we're gonna have dicey weather, then being in the town hall will actually be our backup plan. So we're gonna do that for a little while. Um, so what we are going to ask, this is a little bit different, so we are going to ask you to kind of register, let us know you're coming basically, just so we know kind of how to plan, you know, as we're spacing stuff out, whether we're inside or we're outside, just so we have an idea. It's not like if you don't register, you can't come type of thing. Um, we just, we just want to know. So that will be um, via email as well. So uh, I'm going to pray for our service and then Michael is going to come up and sing. So. Heavenly Father, it is so good, Lord, to be in your presence in what is the house of the Lord. Lord, we are on holy ground, and we are so grateful for you, for your Son, Jesus Christ, for your Holy Spirit. We are so thankful that we can come together and see each other and be in um, this congregation in communion with you and with each other. Father, this service is yours, and we lift it up to you. In your Son's holy name, amen. And so, yep, come on up. <laughs> so just a reminder for now, please just come along with Michael or sing in your hearts and the same as Denise comes up. We are so blessed to have these musicians. Thank you. Blessing for me, for sure. All right, this one is a, is a real beauty, so I can always say. <laughs> I count on one thing, saying God who never fails, will not fail me now, will not fail me now in the waiting, saying God who never leaves, is working all things out, working all things out, and yes I will, lift you high in my lowest valley, yes I will. I bless your name, oh yes I will. Sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh yes I will, all my days. I count on one. God who never fails, you won't fail me now, will not fail me now in the waiting. Saying God who never leaves is working all things out, working all things out, and yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley, yes I will, I bless your name. Sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name above all names. That nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify his name above all names. Oh, yes, I will. 
148. I'm going to be reading Psalm 148 this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the sky. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He set them in place forever and ever. He gave a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. He has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his saints of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. over all these molehills. <laughs> kind of hard in flip-flops. <clears throat> you all have no idea how happy I am to be standing before you in person today singing instead of that camera. <laughs> Don't ask me why, but every week when I would stand in front of that camera to record it, I got so nervous. And you all know I'm, I'm not nervous. I get up here, I sing, I talk like I could go on forever. Um, you did a great job. <laughs> thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, I, had, I had emailed Cynthia earlier in the week because I am a theme person. And when I sing, I really would like to sing something that goes along with the theme of the message. And when she sent me Troy's message um, and I searched and searched and searched, and there's very little out there for song. And so I took it upon myself, I was gonna learn something. I tried, not enough time, not happening. And so I said, well, I'm just gonna do whatever. And so a song, you know, I started singing this one song, a, a nice hymn, and this other song came to my mind, not even really related to the song I was originally going to do. And it reminded me of something my grandfather used to say, very wise old gentleman. And he would always say, there are two words, and I don't recall his words exactly, but um, the gist of it, there are two words. And if we can live by those two words, that's everything, trust and obey. We trust and we obey, pretty much says it all. So thinking about that um, and my grandfather, I thought, that's it, that's what I'm doing. So I'm going to be sharing with you today the hymn, Trust and Obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, 
but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a sigh or a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. <clears throat> But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows, for the joy he bestows, or for those who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do where he sends, we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, for grace to trust him more. Trust and obey. going to pray for a uh, Troy sermon and then I'm going to read his the scripture uh, that he has been preaching on. So, Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to read your word, to hear someone sing your praises, to be out here, Lord, together, praising your name. What a privilege it is that we have your word that we can learn from, that it can pierce our hearts, Lord, and so that we can better serve you. 
Lord, we pray that your hands are upon Troy's shoulders as he comes and speaks your word. We pray for your Holy Spirit's nudging, Lord, as he preaches to us, and for our hearts to be open and be fertile ground for what you have taught him this week, and he will then teach us. In your son's holy and precious name, amen. Uh, so the reading this morning is Matthew 28, 16 through 20, and then Matthew 5, 2 through 12. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry. No, thank you. <laughs> I was looking to match up with you. Uh, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. And then Matthew 5. Two through twelve. Matthew five, two through twelve. And he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. No one around me. I'm craving this. Oh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. This would be a positive result of the pandemic is being able to sit out here in God's creation and enjoy the fresh air and good company and all the green. Open up my water. I came prepared. Whoa! Whoa! So much for being prepared. <laughs> awful water. See? We have this joke about seltzer. She drinks seltzer. I really don't care for it. And I call it awful water. It just lives up to its name. But do you drink it? All right. Here we go. <clears throat> so I thought that was interesting, the discussion about challenges, what an appropriate hymn that ended up being, because obedience is certainly a, a theme of this morning's uh, message. Uh, thank you all just for the privilege of being able to uh, just candidate throughout the, the, the few months and the interruption that we had, but we've been live, we've been on video. Sister, I hear you about the nervousness. Uh, it's a totally different experience recording yourself, but uh, you know, we try to be faithful to the Lord, and, uh, you know, as, as things change around us, uh, things, uh, you know, what the Lord seeks, what he wants, uh, his, his nature, his person, what he wants for the church remains consistent. We, just, we still have work to do, and we've got a God to worship. We have, uh, we have all manner of things in front of us, and, uh, you know, God is almighty. I just shared that earlier. So he's bigger than the pandemic. He's bigger than uh, all these other things. So... Let's pray, let's make much of Jesus, and uh, let's dive in. So, Father God, thank you for the privilege of uh, just being here this morning, and uh, Lord, gathering outside and uh, just uh, enjoying the beauty that you have created. You're an artist, Lord. Uh, thank you for this uh, faith community that you've gathered together under, under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, Lord. Thank you for the salvation uh, we have through him, uh, for the forgiveness of our sins, Lord. We look forward to an eternity in heaven with you. Um, hey, Father, just open our hearts and our minds this morning to your word, uh, to the message. As always, uh, we want to worship you and give you all the glory, and we want to be changed. We want to be transformed uh, to, to be more in likeness to Christ as a result of our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
So one of the questions uh, that I received from the Zoom Q&A that we had uh, that was, uh, was a lot of fun and so different and unexpected, uh, and there were many good questions, but this one stood out to me was, what do you think are the most urgent difficulties and challenges facing the American church? That's a, that's a deep dive question. We spend a lot of time talking about that. We're gonna spend a little bit of time uh, trying to, to answer that this morning. We're facing a number of challenges, honestly. Um, if you pay any attention at all to uh, news or have conversations with people who are out and about, there's a lot happening out there in our country. Um, we live currently in the society which is just enthralled uh, by this expressive individualism, this create your own identity and then ask for legislation to validate it and enforce it. Uh, this kind of thing is going on. Why? Because American, uh, America has become post-Christian friends. We're, we're, we're shifting through history here a little bit. Um, less than 50% of people being polled currently are putting a check in the I am a Christian box. This is, this is a new kind of reality for us. Um, people are increasingly isolated. They're fragmented. They're polarized. We just see all of this going on around us. Um, you know, we face these incredible social and political challenges and those are now often conflated. In the midst of all of that, as less and less people view uh, religion as viable, Christians appear strange and threatening to all these new things happening in culture. Um, you know, people are, are not so captivated by classic Christian morality. They now see it as old fashioned uh, and even extreme or dangerous. And little seems very effective in stemming the tide of these issues they just they seem to have a life of their own and they're just they're just barreling forward and and of course it's causing us concern and and upset what's what's going on we know that as christians we love jesus and we want to impact the world for him for his kingdom but with all these existing difficulties, and we just, we're just dipping our toe in the pool here, friends, the few things that I mentioned, we don't seem to be doing as well as we could be in the face of them. And that's kind of perplexing, considering if you go online and just look up church ministries and, and, and things, and the word impact is used so often uh, in any of these programs, uh, their titles, their, uh, you know, their vision statements, but where's the impact? This is not some blanket condemnation of God's church. Jesus is the head, you know, his will be done. We're not, that's not what's happening here, so don't get me wrong, but it's difficult to observe all of this that's happening around us because there's a reason that question was asked, right? You don't ask what are the difficulties if you don't sense there, there are some, you know? So the question is valid. We see these things happening, we observe them, it's going to give us some measure of concern regarding the American church. So I ask again, what's going on? In the meeting, I didn't really give too much of an answer because it's a big one. And so I said, well, you know, let's have some coffee. Well, we're having some coffee. The answer is both complex and simple. The short version is that we live in a country that allows us no end of distractions. This is a great country. This is a great experiment that we live in. We've been enticed by those things, we're human. And I think that in, in some ways, maybe many ways, we've lost some sight of the mission. Without meaning to, we have imitated the world a little better than we've imitated the kingdom of God. We've allowed culture to animate us a bit more than we've allowed the Bible to animate us. This isn't true of all Christians and all churches, but it's true enough with all these things that are happening we should all feel some sense of responsibility, some accountability. No solutions present themselves when everyone is just shifting blame around. We need to kind of accept our part in order to move things forward. So given all of that, the question becomes, what do we do about it? How do we have a more powerful impact on the world around us? And I think the answer is simple, four words. Get back on mission. That sounds wonderful. Amen, we're done. Just get back. No, no, wait, wait. <laughs> the answer's simple. 
but to draw it out and to have an understanding of it, that's a little bit more complex. That's what we're going to turn our attention to. So thank you, Cynthia, for reading Matthew 28. That's the Great Commission, right? Verses 18 through 20 is where we're going to zero in. I'm just going to read them again. You can follow along with me in your version. I read from the ESV. Yours may be the NIV or the NASB. We're people of acronyms. So my version says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So contained right there within those few verses, that's the mission. Oh, here's a side effect of being outside. The pages turn on their own. <clears throat> the verses, they contain the mission, the Great Commission. The final instructions that Jesus spoke to his followers before ascending to heaven. That's it right there. I believe that most churches, when they start, they're mindful of this mission. They're excited about the mission. They're focused on the mission. But over time, I think the mission starts to get a little obscured and other things supersede it and replace it. The Great Commission ends up becoming the Great Omission. So if we truly want to impact this world, if we want to do our part in advancing the kingdom of God, then we need to return to the instructions that the Lord gave us. We need to understand them, and then we need to carry them out. Remember, to be doers of the word, not just hearers. If we want to have impact, and if we love Jesus, we should, then we need to follow his instructions that he gave to the church. So let's consider these instructions now. Let's do a little bit of exegesis uh, on these passages. So right out the gate, notice that the instructions themselves fall between two things. They're bookended by a great affirmation and a great promise. What's the affirmation? Look to verse 18. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Friends, that's an astounding claim. You go try to walk out in public and say something like that and see what happens to you. When you consider that Matthew is writing his gospel maybe one generation after the crucifixion of Jesus. And so here, a man crucified as a state criminal by the Roman authorities claims to be the one to whom Caesar himself will bend the knee. That he is the Lord, not just of the church. He's the Lord of history. He's the Lord of governments. He's the Lord of the nations. He's the Lord of the universe. That's the statement. That's the claim that Jesus is making there. That's the affirmation that early Christians made when they confessed at their baptism that Jesus Christ is Lord. And see, that affirmation, it's more than just some personal statement. It's more than just a political statement. It is a cosmic proclamation of supreme and universal lordship. And the Great Commission, the instructions, flow out of that affirmation. It is because Jesus Christ, this crucified Jew, because he is the Lord of the nations, that his followers in turn have a mission to the nations. Now notice that word, therefore, depending on your translation. It links the great affirmation with the great commission. See, because verse 19 continues, depending on your version, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now I've got to pause here. There's only one verb in the great commission. It's make disciples. That's the verb. That's the imperative. It's a command. So a lot of our English translations, they mislead us a little bit here because they often come, they, they begin with some version of the verb go. But in Greek, go is a present participle. For those of you that are English majors, I was one of those weird kids that loved to diagram sentences when I was in school. <laughs> so it should read, if we're actually using correct grammar, therefore as you're going, make disciples of all nations okay so you see how that changes the context of the sentence 
The emphasis is not on the going. The emphasis is on making disciples. So really, whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, however you're going about it, make disciples. That's the instruction. Make disciples of all nations. No boundaries, no preferences to make disciples in one place over another. No exclusions. Scripture says, for the Lord sees, not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Jesus is saying, the whole world is your mission field. Invite all peoples of all cultures and all geographical areas to become my students to learn from me. That's what's being said here. The disciples to whom Jesus is speaking, they were all Jews who left their jobs, everything that they owned to follow this man, to become his devoted students, right? Because that's what a disciple means, a student and a follower. So now Jesus says, just as you have followed me and learned from me during these past three years, now you also invite everyone else. And this was the tough part for them because that includes the non-Jews, the Gentiles. Anybody who's not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And the catch that also kind of gets lost is that he didn't give these instructions to apostles only, to elders only, to deacons only. He gave them to disciples. He's speaking to the role. So who is a disciple? Anyone who knows Jesus as their Savior and Lord is a disciple. So this instruction applies to all Christians everywhere at all times. There's no escape. Now Jesus always gives good instructions. So he didn't just make this big pronouncement and say, okay, get going. How did he do it? Jesus shares that information in verse 19. It continues. It says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Like everything in these three verses, this flows from the command, the verb, the imperative, to make disciples. So in the time of Jesus, around 2,000 years ago, to be baptized into the name of somebody meant to come under the headship of that person, to swear fealty to that person. You became, in a sense, that person's property. To be baptized into the name of the triune God, our God is three persons in one. That means that now your supreme loyalty is no longer to yourself or to your biological family, or to your culture, or your ethnic group, or your nation state. It is to the triune God. You belong to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. That is where discipleship begins. Now, baptism is a corporate event. Right? It's, it's a community event. It's not an individual event. You don't accept Jesus and go find a lake by yourself and go jump in. You're baptized into the community of all those who profess the name of Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So it is in the context of community that people learn what discipleship means. Because discipleship is not something that we can learn in solitude. We cannot learn it on our own. We can have a personal relationship, and we should, with God on our own. But that's not the same as being a disciple. It is in community that we learn what it is to be a follower and a student of Jesus. And to grow into the mission of Jesus. We're saved for a purpose, friends. Now, once Jesus delivered this charge to his followers, something happened. Baptism is no longer optional because it's given within a command. The scripture contains several examples of new Christians who submitted in obedience immediately after salvation. Paul and Silas instructed their jailer to receive Christ and be baptized in Acts chapter 16. And likewise, one of my favorite stories in all of scripture, Philip took the Ethiopian eunuch right into the water 
after hearing his confession of faith. And how cool is God? The Bible says that Philip is just carried away by the Holy Spirit, and suddenly he finds himself in Azotos. Like, I may, I'm probably massacring that word, have mercy. How cool is that? I don't know if you know, Kelly and I were discussing, was he teleported? Was it like Mary Poppins? I don't know, but he was carried away. But that Ethiopian eunuch, he received the good news, he accepted Christ, and he was immediately baptized. If possible, the first act of a new Christian should be to follow the examples in Scripture and to be baptized. That's often a point of rebellion, you know. Sometimes it takes a long time for Christians to reach that point of baptism. There's a, there's a bit of a struggle between them and God there, so we should not be... We should not be processing it that way. That's not the command. It is to know your scripture well and to understand it. So let's continue reading. Verse 20. So we're, how do we do it? We're baptizing. We're continuing. How we do it? We're teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And I like Cynthia's version because it actually puts in the word obey in place of observe. And that's accurate. This isn't just kind of take a look at these things and say that's nice. No. To obey them. This is what my grandfather would call a rubber meets the road verse. Here is the instruction. This is the part of the verses here that leads us to going from making converts to making disciples. So let me ask you all something. This is rhetorical, so you don't actually have to raise your hands here. But does anyone here observe, obey all that Jesus has commanded you? No. If you raise your hand, please see me afterwards because I want to know what you're doing because there's room for improvement for me. No one's going to raise their hands because we're all works in progress. We all continue to struggle with sin. Our salvation is secure in Christ, but we will not be completely free of sin until we cross over into eternity. So what this means is that while we're here on earth, no Christian has arrived as a disciple. Discipleship is a lifelong process. So this dispels the notion that there's some elite cadre of Christians who are the ones responsible for making disciples while others sit idly by because we all need to be discipled throughout our entire lives. So if somebody is not doing some discipling, somebody else is getting missed. Paul makes a distinction regarding maturity. This is kind of important as we consider this in 1 Corinthians. He talks about milk and solid food as far as your spiritual health and your spiritual growth as a faith community we consider this we're all at different points in our walk with Christ so we work together to make sure we're discipling and being discipled appropriately okay discipleship is intentional it is not ad hoc it's not haphazard So we want to make an impact on the culture, on the world. We love Jesus. We want to do that. We want to be obedient. We want to follow the mission given to us by Jesus. Whatever, wherever, however, we're going to stay on mission. We're going to make disciples. We're going to baptize them. And we're going to teach them the commands Jesus gave us. We're going to search the scriptures so we know those commands. We're going to pray that the Holy Spirit would help us grasp and understand them and enable us to teach them well. If we do all of those things, we will have some confidence that the people of God will live their, way, their lives in ways that please God, that the kingdom of God will advance. Amen? That sound fair? Amen. What does that look like, I wonder? This is a trap we can get into when we talk. We talk about a lot of top-level things, but you need to know what what you're talking about. What does it look like? Because you need a target, right? If you aim at nothing, you're going to hit it every time. you got to know where to point the arrow. If the goal is nebulous, it'll be difficult to reach it. So, this is why we read Matthew chapter 5. In what we call the Beatitudes, Jesus is actually spelling out the characteristics of those who belong to his kingdom. I have a friend chirping and preaching along with me. These Beatitudes, if you like, they're the hallmarks of disciples of Christ. 
So we're going to talk about them. This is not intended to be a comprehensive study of the Beatitudes this morning. That involves a whole series of sermons. A number of books have been written about this. But I do hope and pray that just within the context of a brief review of them, this morning we have a clearer goal in mind for what Jesus means when he tells us to make disciples. What's the goal? What does it look like? Let's, let's kind of pull out our canvas. My wife's a painter, so I kind of think in these, these terms. Pull out our canvas and and do our best to paint a picture of a disciple of Jesus. So if you're in Matthew 5, if you have that open, you can follow along. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. People who are poor in spirit are those who are humble before God. They've afflicted their souls. What does that mean? It means that they have humbled themselves and they've repented with deep contrition. This is when you cry out and you just fall to your knees before the Lord about these things. They come to the king as helpless and hopeless sinners. You know, it's depending on when you accepted Christ for me, you know, just back in 2008, I can just so connect with this moment that that burden from Bunyan's story just, you know, just caused me to just cry out once I realized it was there and how heavy it was. For those who are poor in spirit, there's no, there's no arrogance in them. There's no self-righteousness. There's no self-sufficiency. Everyone who wishes to enter the kingdom must be spiritually poor because salvation, spiritual wealth, is a gift from God. Then Jesus continues. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. See, for those who are mourning in the faith, it's a mourning not just for the suffering and for the sadness of life, but for the sinfulness that causes it in the first place. And in their mourning, the disciples of Jesus, they've opened their heavy hearts to the Lord, and they know, they know that their grieving is not without hope. They know that their weeping and grieving is but for a time only. They know that suffering and death does not have the final victory. For the dead in Christ will be raised and corrupted. Jesus continues, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In the Bible, the meek are those who have a spirit of gentleness and self-control. My kids would argue that I need to work on this one a little bit more. They're free from malice and a condescending spirit. The meek do not exploit and oppress others. They're not given to vengeance and vendettas. They're not violent. They don't try to seize power for their own ends. In short, what have they done? They've emulated the nature of Jesus in their lives and they've learned from him. They may be gentle and humble, but they can and do champion the needs of the weak and the oppressed. Meekness does not imply lack of strength. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. This beatitude is not simply describing those who are righteous or who try to do good things. It's describing their passion in life. They hunger and thirst for it. Righteousness here has two meanings. One would certainly be in the personal life, the strong desire to be pleasing to God to do what God wants, to live up to the will of God. But out of this would grow the desire for righteousness in the land, for social justice in a world that is unrighteous and unjust. Take a moment and stretch. There's a lot of information coming your way. Take a big breath. I'm gonna actually have a sip of my awful water. sort of like you ever heard the concept of a memory palace where you take things and you, you visualize a place to put your memories you give them images so paint this picture of the beatitudes fill in your image of what a disciple looks like it helps keep the pieces in place so you don't lose where you began 
on the way to getting to the end. So Jesus continues as we, as we continue painting. He says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. One thing that is common to the poor in spirit, to the meek, and those who hunger for righteousness is that their life is not self-sufficient, but it looks outward for help. And when they receive gracious and merciful bounty from the king, they in turn know to show mercy to others. Showing mercy to others, it includes both the forgiveness of the sinner and compassion for those who are suffering and the needy, it's not that they're merciful by nature, but because they have been shown mercy and they live in constant dependence of the Lord. None of these beatitudes are pull yourself by, by the bootstraps. This is, this is the spirit of God working in his followers. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This beatitude it describes both a, an inner purity and a singleness of mind. To be pure in heart means that the, the decisions one makes, the desires one has, the thoughts and intentions of the will, they're untarnished by sin, and that the will is it's determined to be pleasing to God. Lord, I'm going to please you, help me. From the pure of heart comes only good things, acts of love and mercy, desires for righteousness and justice, decisions that please God, the transformation from a heart of flesh to a pure heart, that comes from following Christ. And those who enter this kingdom of righteousness, they must have this new heart. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I'm working on my kids with this one, one of my most frequently uttered phrases in the house is, and at all possible, with the peace with one another. God is the God of peace, so I have hope that someday we'll get there. His whole plan of redemption is what? To provide peace with God for those who are formerly separated from God, and ultimately just to bring peace to the whole world, to the whole creation. Those who are peacemakers are then first and foremost people who understand what true peace is. Their effort is, is to strive to establish a peace that embraces God's provision of peace so that people will be in harmony with one another because they're at peace with God. When we try to attain peace in other ways, we may have a limited window where things settle down, but that won't last. It's only through God's provision of peace that we'll have that. Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. Now this beatitude is for followers of Christ. Those who suffer persecution for the sake of righteousness. And as the next verse then clarifies to the disciples, that means suffering for the sake of Jesus, for his name. They've been identified by faith with the king. They carry his name. They proclaim good news that there is a kingdom of righteousness and peace that is spiritual and eternal but they will find opposition. But nevertheless, they should rejoice for the reward in heaven will be great. God will make it up to them and more. So in those verses, Jesus gives us a model to study, to aim for as we strive to be and to make disciples. So you've got a canvas now, you've got some painting. Follows it up immediately in verses 13 and 14 with these two remarkable metaphors salt and light. Who's that? These two metaphors, they reveal the kind of impact we're talking about impact this morning. The kind of impact disciples who have this beatitude character, this beatitude canvas, they'll have the, the impact they will have in their societies and the world into which he is sending them. That's what the salt in life is talking to us about. He says, you are the salt. What did you just call me? You are the salt. That's a good thing. Why? Because salt in many poor societies has got something like 14,000 uses. We're just going to talk about one. 
Salt in many poor societies is a disinfectant. It's an antiseptic. You rub it into meat to prevent the meat from going bad. He says disciples that are demonstrating the Beatitudes in their character, they ought to be rubbed into society like salt rubbed into meat. Why? To, to arrest, to stop, to prevent, to slow down the moral and spiritual decay happening out there. Follow me there? Salt, it's good. So if someone calls you salt, don't be offended. Or at least if another Christian calls you salt. Then Jesus positively says, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works. Those works of justice, those works of showing mercy, those works of peacemaking and reconciliation. Shine your light, Jesus says, and then men and women will be attracted to the worship of the one you call your heavenly father. So not only letting the world here you're evangelizing, you have to use words to share the good news, but letting the world also see the good works that come from the fact that you know the good news. So Jesus, we learn from reading these verses today, expects of the church, that's you and me friends, which is out here in the world, literally this morning, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom to all of the nations, no exclusions. How's that done? That's done by making disciples, by being disciples ourselves. When we remain on the mission, there's no doubt that our country and our culture will be positively kingdom impacted. So something to ask yourself right now, just kind of pause for a moment and, and reflect how do you compare to that image, to that painting of the disciple that we just worked on together? What colors are just right? Or what touches of the brush are needed to kind of flesh out the image a little bit better? Ask God the tough question. Ask him to help you see those areas clearly so that he can work on them with you. Are you feeling encouraged after today's message? I hope that you feel encouraged. But maybe you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed. That's possible. And let me share what another pastor wrote about the mission. He said this. He said, baptizing the whole world in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all God's commands. These are not small requests. Jesus is entrusting us with a great responsibility, he said, one of witnessing to the whole world about the whole story of God's love for us. Baptism in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit isn't really as simple as taking someone to have a dunk in the tank. So if that's true, where does that leave us? Well, sometimes we seem to line up with that canvas painting pretty well. We walk in step with the Spirit and we get it right. But other times, we will doubt, we will stumble, we will fail. But Jesus' command here ultimately does not depend on us, even though it asks for our all. And so now, remember the beginning, I said the instructions were bookended by two things, great affirmation and a great promise. So here we are at the great promise. Jesus says, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the promise of Christ. The one who suffered and died for our sake so that our sins might be forgiven. So that we can be saved. That we can be with him for all eternity. This Jesus, he promises his empowering spirit, his presence to us, the church. Jesus' command, his instructions will ultimately prevail. Because Jesus, who is God himself, will be with us always. And because Jesus will be with us always, we will all have the grace we need to share God's love in word and deed to fulfill the mission and to make a kingdom impact on this world, friends. And we can start to see some of these things pushed back, arrested. Get out there and rub some salt into the culture, into our country. Shine our light, encourage others to worship the one that we call our Heavenly Father.
Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the privilege, the safety of being able to meet here this morning. Lord, thank you for the, the blessing of property, of a, of a nice lawn, shaded trees. Lord, you gave us a beautiful day with sunshine. We're just grateful for all those things, Lord. We're thankful so much, Lord, that, that we're saved, that Jesus came here 2,000 years ago, lived as a human, he suffered, he died for our sake. He became sin, the Bible says. He was nailed to the cross so that our sins might be forgiven, Lord, so that we might receive eternal life. Where would we be without that, Lord? We would be, without you, we would be doomed. It is only because of you, Lord. So that's why we're gathered this morning, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your instructions. Thank you that we're saved with a purpose. Lord, thank you that you explain clearly what you want from us. Lord, help us to follow what you've commanded. We live in, not, not every age is the same, Lord. I, I hear some kind of say it's, it's, it's happening the same as it always has happened. I don't believe that. Times change. Things advance. Culture today is not the same as culture 100 years ago. We face unique and serious challenges today, Lord. Help us to not, not seek comfort and stability as much as we seek to obey you, to love you. You said if, 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 you, if we love you, we'll follow your commands. Lord, let that be so. Help us to, to engage. Help us to, to really take your mission to heart, to, to get with you on it, Lord. We don't have to be afraid of it. You're with us always. We're not doing this alone. You didn't send us out unarmed and unarmored to go do this. Lord, you're there with us every step of the way. Help us to be fearless. Help us to trust and obey, Lord. Trust in your promise, trust in your affirmation, and obey what you've asked. And Lord, I so believe, I so believe that if we do that, if we, if we get back to basics a bit here, if we just really get your word held up in front of us and live by it, we will see change. The kingdom will grow. How could it not? So, Father, just bless this church, its mission, its community, to do what you have for it, Lord, to be faithful. Because I am confident that if that is the case, the kingdom of God will advance. This church, this gathering of people will impact the world in the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray that for all churches throughout the world, Lord. Just be with us. Prepare us, Lord, for this week. Whatever it is that you have us, that you would have us do. Help us to see it and to do it, to be not just doers of the word, but doers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, friends. Shields up. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Dedicating this one to my brother Jeff. It's a great song. <laughs> it's such a great song. Jeff's always been so encouraging to me uh, with the music, and I really, really, really appreciate it. Uh, truly. Uh, when, we, uh, when we had Bible study here, uh, back to the men's group, uh, just so encouraging all that time, Jeff. I really, really appreciate that. This song is about um, just the majesty of everything, you know. Uh, you know.
Like the rivers flow from the mountains high Like the eagle soar with their eagle eye Like the dandelion dome breaks open and flies With the slightest wind Declaring the glory of our Lord, declaring the glory from ages old, this long, long story told Emmanuel would come, and our Savior King, who gave everything to bring us home. We go singing, declaring the glory of our Lord, declaring the glory of our, our Lord, of you, Lord, of our Lord, of our We're going to do this one soon. Not ashamed of the gospel. The power of God changes everything. Not ashamed of the gospel. The love of God through our Savior of me. Not ashamed of the gospel. Not ashamed of the gospel. 